To be political is to be on the side of the angels. It is the correct choice. If you are not political, you are, are a reactionary. If you are not God's child, you are the devil's. Everyone is preoccupied with politics and with sex. These are the imperatives of our time. A century ago it was religion. Christianity struggling to attain the total allegiance of minds made freer by the opening up of the world by science, by information. Religion and nationalism. Two hundred years ago? Three hundred? Every epoch has different preoccupations, judged by posterity as symptoms. It was as a direct result of writing the Golden Notebook that I started an active study of mysticism. I was at a stage in my life when everything had to change. Into my forties, and behind me battles about sex, about politics, fight, fight all the way. I shaped that book to say, because it was what I had learned, that if one divided oneself up, lived with a compartmented mind, it was to invite disaster, which could be cured sometimes only by breakdown. I was surrounded by people in breakdown because of sex, because of politics. The book was taken as a trumpet for women's liberation. All right, fair enough, it was written by a woman. But the status of women was not then my priority. Because while I wrote that book, I was thinking about my life so hard and in a new way, all kinds of ideas not known to me before came flooding in. When I had finished it, I knew I had either to pretend I had not had new ideas, intimations, experiences, or accept that I could no longer be the same person. I am sure that a great many people reaching this place in their lives do close a door, do say, no, this never happened, because they cannot face being called wrong-headed, eccentric, silly. To be precise, I could no longer accept the contemporary package. This consists of materialism, socialism, or an association with one of the many churches of Marxism, and atheism, belief in material progress and that the betterment of society can come only through political action. Now I see this package as pitifully meagre and empty, but it was hard to jettison because it is the current orthodoxy, which for some reason is able to see itself as fresh, original and brave, and because I did not know how to look elsewhere. I read and I read. The various kinds of Buddhism, the yogas, Christian mysticism, Hinduism, Islam. The libraries have it all, but you must find your own way. Current education excludes nearly everything that is not part of the package. One of the results of this vacuum in our education is that a highly educated young person can be vulnerable to an encounter with a bogus cult. Even scientists are not immune. I emerged from all this study with two main ideas. One, that all religions and types of mysticism say the same thing in different words that it is possible for anyone to transcend the little cage, which is how some people experience ordinary life, and to come nearer to God, or Allah, or the Almighty, or the other, that power greater than ourselves who is not to be made a property of any religion or sect or arrangement of words. Two, that in this area one should have a guide, otherwise the journey can be dangerous. At once I came up against a formidable barrier in myself and in society. Everywhere in the world, but those societies we call the West, or those that are Western, probably temporarily, because they are communist, the idea of an exemplar or teacher is a foundation of culture. Had I been in, let us say, India or Japan, to choose a teacher would have been what ordinary people did. But the West long ago outlawed this idea, making the churches the sole road to God. I am of that rapidly increasing number of people who see early Christianity as a history of power lovers getting rid of any people or evidence that did not suit their purposes. Over 300 contemporary accounts of Jesus were destroyed by them. Jesus became God, unlike in Islam, which does not claim divinity for Muhammad, but says he was the last in a long line of public teachers, among them Jesus. In the West, to accept a teacher is to know you will be described as weak-minded, easily influenced, in need of a father figure. It is hard on one's pride. And I had had more than enough of power lovers, mostly male, in politics. As far as I was concerned, they were indistinguishable from priests. 
I disliked everything I heard or read about gurus. I did not then know that Sufis regard the guru phenomenon as a degeneration and the people who pursue them as unfortunate. In the course of my search, I explored a number of sects and cults. Now I see this as a useful experience. Then I was distressed and confused. So many obviously self-deluded or cynical teachers. So many people joining this or that because clearly they needed a family or tribe. So much weirdness, dottiness. Above all, these cults were all at a sharp angle to ordinary life, were cultural sidewaters. I heard about Idris Shah during my inquiries as a Sufi from Afghanistan with a sort of education that enabled him to be at home both in the East and in the West. I had found what I had read about Sufism exotic and not to my taste, but was told that my Western ideas about Sufis tended to be ill-informed and that the situation was being made worse by charlatans claiming to be Sufi teachers. Idris Shah was genuine in the opinion of my informants who'd had experience of cults, sects, and various kinds of teachers. They said he was writing a book. I felt this book might turn out to be what I was looking for. You could say I had a hunch about it. The book was the Sufis. I read it feeling it was for me. I was also amazed at the robustness of its claims. I had had no idea how much Sufis had influenced the world, had helped to shape Western culture. How could I, when even an expert like Bertrand Russell could write a history of Western philosophy and never mention facts that were easily available for him to know and part of credited and respectable scholarship? But my interest was not then, is not now, primarily academic. I mention this aspect of the Sufis because I feel it will turn out to have been one of the most remarkable books published in our time with the potential for revolutionizing several fields of study. I have friends who are historians, specialists in Eastern studies, anthropologists, sociologists, who claim their ideas have been widened by this book and others by Idris Shah. That was 20 years ago. The stages of work under a master are described in a thousand records, so I can say that nothing has been surprising. But I can say, too, that every new stage is surprising because the old phrases, terms, concepts come to life in context where you do not expect them. Here is an example. Having read the Sufi several times and thought hard, I wrote to Idris Shah asking him to take me on as a pupil. I heard nothing for a long time. In my then state of mind, it seemed forever. But I reflected on all the old books I had read and remembered that teachers tested potential pupils. An intriguing idea. When at last I did hear, it was the driest note, calculated to put off the most enthusiastic. And indeed, I know people who, receiving this cold response, lost interest then and there or were offended. What they had expected was to be treated as an important acquisition. It was months before I heard again. At last I saw that I was being taught, in the indirect way that is traditional, that I was approaching the subject in the wrong way. Hot enthusiasm was not needed, but something cooler, quieter, more observant. When I actually did meet Shah, after all that impatience, I missed every opportunity I was given to ask real questions, making me think about the relationship between impatience, greed, heedlessness, what strikes me now when I read about other people's journeys into the mystical is how vague and elevating it all is. Everything with Shah, on the contrary, is cool, exact, specific. If anything can, can be called exciting, it is the subtlety of the psychological understanding of people, groups, social developments that is the age-old Sufi endowment, so much more advanced than anything we know in the West. But while this may be fascinating as an intellectual interest, to keep up with it is very hard work. It is easy to illustrate the Sufi claim that it is not possible to explain things beyond a certain point to someone outside the Sufi context. A person may ask, but what do you do? When I tell them the outside facts, the response is likely to be, but is that all? Yet this can also happen with people who have attended Shah's teaching sessions even for some time. One man, when I asked why he had stepped through a session, said that Shah wasn't doing anything. 
Shah teaches in subtle, sometimes difficult to observe ways. This is because we are accustomed in ordinary meetings, political or otherwise, to look for emotional arousal and excitement, because in our culture we are continually assaulted by strong stimuli. For many people it happens that everything that took them to the Sufis in the first place is soon shed. The demand for instant enlightenment, an appetite for secrets and for exciting occasions, described by Shah as thrills, spills and chills. The insistence, I want it now. All the responses, in fact, of our having and wanting society. Or the hopeful student leaves because none of these desires are fed anywhere near a real Sufi. Another difficulty. If it was hard to accept that one needed a teacher, it was hard to accept one's fellow pupils. I remember the surprise in every face on a certain evening at a certain preparatory class. What? These people want spiritual fellow aspirants. For we arrange our lives to exclude abrasive people, particularly those who do not share our opinions. I, for one, did not know that this was what I had been doing until I found myself with people chosen by a different measure. was made to see how very intolerant, in fact, we all tend to be. We were invited to study contemporary psychology, the information relating to the structure of groups. People put together with others they have not chosen will react automatically with suspicion and dislike. It is the group animal in us. We were told that the Sufis did not start at a level lower than had been attained by the society they were working in, and that if we wished to equip ourselves with more sophisticated information, we could begin by familiarizing ourselves with the research available on the shelves of any bookshop in the field of psychology, anthropology, sociology. We could first become adequately equipped people in terms of our own culture. It will be seen that not everyone in pursuit of higher knowledge will find this enticing fair. Other people, myself among them, were relieved that the real achievements of our own cultures were recognized. Sufis say that every new introduction of the Sufi tradition is framed in contemporary terms, using the conventions of the society as a vehicle. I have found this to be so. People with an appetite for the archaic or the bizarre have to leave. As the English Sufi, Richard Burton, said a hundred years ago in his marvelous poem, The Qasida, what we have to learn first is how to unlearn. Unlearn thirst for sensations, flattery, attention. Unlearn national, racial, class biases. Shah's pupils are of all religions, nationalities, races, classes, every type of education and experience. There are as many women as men. We all have to have a solid base in our own cultures, living as ordinary people, learning how to be really useful to humanity, aspiring one day to be in the world but not of it. The human being is given by nature little more energy than what is needed to maintain the species, to reproduce and to live out our very short spans. But if we want to be fit for the journey beyond the limits of ordinary life, we have to learn not to waste energy which we do by busying ourselves too much with material things and by using our minds in wasteful and damaging ways. You will have seen that I am describing concepts familiar to us from the religions put here in a different context. Rescue from being sins or sources of guilt, reintroduced simply as tools. It is not wicked to eat and drink too much, not a sin to be envious, but gluttony makes the way more difficult, and thoughts of enmity keep the mind in a sieve, making subtler inputs impossible. And, besides, laws operate that we have not been taught about, whether we have had the benefit of religion or not. Thoughts of anger, jealousy, enmity and revenge bring retribution. There is nothing theoretical about this. Slowly you learn to see patterns where before you saw nothing because you were being over-emotional. Sufis say the division between theory and practice that is the basis of our education is a recent, historically speaking, distortion. Learning with them is to experience. A Sufi school uses the processes of ordinary daily life when the pupil is ready to observe what is happening. The pupil has to study learning how to learn, the title of one of Shah's books. You have to be able to concede that the teacher is someone who is able to direct all this, 
to concede that there are those who are better and cleverer than oneself. This certainly does not mean the holy, 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 this man or woman is an avatar approach that leads to emotional intoxication and dulling of the mind. It means a readiness to watch what the teacher is doing and to reflect on it. It may take a long time to understand what that word teacher means. Not always or necessarily something personal. It took me some time to see that Shah was using with me the mirror technique, which I knew about in theory because it is clearly described. He was using it in all kinds of ways. In letters, for instance, where my faults of thought and application were copied with such insight that it was hard not to lose a determination to learn and admiration. One of the first things we were told was that we all rush after leaders and gurus, political and religious, because we've been taught to admire leaders, to we want to be given orders, to join groups, to submit ourselves to authority, to say that knowledge is beyond, and that at the best we can have it only when we're dead. We have learnt negative and defeatist attitudes through 2,000 years of an authoritarian religion that has left scars in our minds. We have internalised its rigidities. But we have not been taught that this is what we are like. On the contrary, we are told we are free, democratic, self-determined, individualistic. And as a result, we are infinitely vulnerable to being conditioned to tyrants, propaganda, gurus and leaders, to priests of all kinds. But if you want to learn the Sufi way, then all this must be left behind. Their aim is to become, after a preparatory process, a person able to manage his or her own development, and it is not easy. Throughout the preparatory process, you are expected to study the written material Shah makes available, most of it in his published books. There is a great deal of it, of infinite variety, from scientific information to poetry, and jokes, and tales, some of it new-minted, some of it old. Altogether, it is arranged to make a whole, right for this time, a matrix in which new outlooks and new experiences can develop. It takes time and trouble to familiarize oneself with this material, but it is an essential basis for learning with Idris Shah. There are pupils all over the world who are not in groups, who have not met Shah, but who value this material as a means of self-development. Twenty years can be regarded as a long time, not when you have become attuned to the Sufi way of thinking in millennia. The human community is evolving, all of us, whether we know it or not. We, the creatures of now, are in the caterpillar stage, are, if you like, the missing link. The claim is that Sufis are aligned with the evolutionary drive. Students are not given the promise, you are chosen to be saved, but if you can learn to align yourselves with us, you can contribute to the real progress of humanity. Finally, people ask, how can you, a feminist, have anything to do with an Islam-based study? First, the real Sufis will say that Sufism is not more Muslim than Christian, that it predated Islam and Christianity because it has always been in the world under one name or another or none, and cannot be equated with the temporary phase of any culture though it found a home within conventional Islam for a time. Secondly, it is not enough for us to be concerned with the situation of women. It is the situation of humankind that should be our concern.